So I just want to say welcome. Um, thank you for coming. We're going to start this uh, Brico session. And the title of the Brico session is Affordability, Equability, and Accessibility. So I'm going to introduce, I don't know how Jillian expects me to do this in three minutes, but I'm going to try my best. Um, we have four panelists here. I have Dr. Patricia Williams, Patty, <laughs> AKA Patty. Um, she is a professor in applied human nutrition at Mount St. Vincent University. She has accomplished so many different things. Just to name a few, she has served as a tier two Canadian, or Canada, sorry, research chair in food security and policy change. She's the founder and director of Food Arc, which is Food Action Research Center. She has worked in areas like pediatric and maternity for like a dietitian in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Food in, in mm, slow down, Dawn. <laughs> Food inequities in Nova Scotia, across Canada and beyond. She has several groundbreaking national and provincial studies on food-related policy change. Patty, Dr. Williams, is currently works, oh, work, current work focuses on the expenses, oh, experience, oh my goodness, I'm way just, too fast. You could just skip through that. <laughs> no, we want to know all about you. Um, on the experiences of stigma, shame, and social inclusion, particularly for women living in poverty, struggling with food insecurity. How's that? But I have a whole page. No. So our next um, guest is Sue, and I am not going to butcher her name because I cannot pronounce it. So Sue has arrived here in Mi'kma'ki from Turkey and Cyprus about seven years ago while completing her bachelor's degree at Del in environmental science at Dalhousie University. Um, she has become a part of the direct action groups on campuses such as Divest, Dow, and the Loaded Ladle. These organizations serve as an antidote to the isolation of food security and echo anxiety she experienced herself as an international student. She currently builds on this work by connecting communities by preparing, serving, and talking about free, accessible, and good food as a coordinator of the Loaded Ladle. The Loaded Ladle is a volunteer and student-run food collective um, that provides free meals to students for, over ten, for the last 10 years. The next person is Josh. Josh is the CEO of First Food no Newfoundland. She, he has also um, been part of my life for the last two years, working to get this conference going. So it's so nice to see him in person. Um, the Food First Newfoundland is a provincial nonprofit organization that works with communities in Newfoundland and Labrador to ensure everyone has access to affordable, healthy, and cultural appropriate, culturally, I missed a word there. Don't know. Anyways, <laughs> he has taken a lead role in many coalitions and campaigns. He co-chairs the Provincial Food Security Working Group with the Nova Scotia or Newfoundland government, sits on the province's Health Accord Task Force. The last one I have here I would like to introduce is Leslie. So Dr. Frank is a sociologist and Canadian Canada Research Chair in Food, Health and Social Justice at Acadia University. Her research uses mixed methods to explore maternal and infant in food insecurity in high income countries, family and child poverty, secondhand baby food exchange via social media, household food insecurity and maternal stigma, food insecurity among post-secondary students and rural access to maternity care. She is also the author of The Out of, the, Out of Milk, an Infant Food Insecurity in a Rich, rich Nation. I welcome you. It was really, really hard to condense everything that these panelists have accomplished. So um, we will start there. I'll just remind you, you have 10 minutes. I'm cutting you off at eight. No, um, I will give you a warning at eight and you guys can just do your thing. Is it on? Yes. All right. Thank you, Dawn. Um, and thanks everybody for being here on last thing on Friday afternoon. Um, so I'm going to draw on research, um, our research at Food Arc to first answer the question, is local, affordable and accessible to all? And second, what we heard through our research is needed and wanted um, in Nova Scotia. So Food Arc has been a hub for collaborative and participatory research, which centers the voices of those, in particular women, with experiences 
of food insecurity. Our research uses mixed methods and different ways of knowing to understand both the why and also what can be done. The work I'm going to share would not have been possible without funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Canada, Nova Scotia Department of Health and Wellness, and CLARI in particular in terms of what I'm presenting today, as well as the work and the commitment of many partners, co-researchers, participants, and students. So first I'm going to briefly address the question of the accessibility of local food. So as part of our um, participatory food costing research that the province funded between 2005 and 2015, we've been collecting data on whether local is available for the items on the list of foods on the what's called the National Nutritious Food Basket, so a basic nutritious diet. Where um, a local item was available, we also compared the cost of the local item relative to a comparable non-local item. What we've seen is a downward trend in availability of local food in grocery stores um, over time, um, disappointingly. In 2007 and 2008, when we first started to report this, local food availability was at 23 and 22% percent respectively. In 2010, so our latest data is 2010, 2012, and 2015, and um, a student worked with us to um, do the analysis of this data. We haven't published it yet, but we found um, 20.6 in 2010, 18.7 in 2012, and 17.9 in 2015 um, in terms of the nutritious food basket items um, that were locally produced. The percentage of locally produced items available at the lowest cost also declined over this period from 15.6% in 2010 to 11.22% um, in 2015. What we do know also from this data is that when a, like, a, when a local food item is available, 75% of the time um, it is um, a more, uh, sorry, a less expensive item than the non-local counterpart, so that's the good news um, part of this, even though availability of the local item has decreased. So next I'm going to turn to the question of food affordability. What we know is that this is not much, so much about the cost of food per se, but rather the ability of households' financial circumstances to afford food and other basic needs. Food insecure households, those who experience inadequate or insecure access to food due to financial constraints, spend substantially less on everything, including rent, mortgages, clothing, other essentials like transportation, they're also more likely um, to make other financial compromises like delaying or forgoing prescription medications. At the core of the problem is income at inadequacy. So what do we know about the adequacy of income for Nova Scotians to be able to purchase a nutritious diet? The cost of the nutritious food basket for a family four in Nova Scotia has increased from 572 in 2002 so that's for the family of four, um, to $935 a month in 2015. That's a 64% increase. Even though we haven't been uh, able to collect food um, costing data since this time, um, in 2015, we've partnered with Food Now, Food to Enhance Our Wellness project, out of um, another project out of Mount St. Vincent University, led by um, two of my colleagues, um, to do virtual food costing using an updated uh, food basket. This was during COVID when we um, couldn't do it in, in uh, store costing. So we engaged in um, assessment of simulated households that include a person living with HIV AIDS um, in Nova Scotia. It, the project is about um, nutrition in, in people with living with HIV AIDS to determine the, if a basic nutritious diet is affordable. And then we, um, we factored in monthly expenses in the same way that we do in our other affordability scenarios where we um, looked at the cost of a daily multivitamin, dispensing fees um, for medications, and additional caloric intake for living with um, people living with HIV AIDS of 10%. Um, so with the updated nutritious food basket that came out in 2020, I believe, 19 maybe, um, it puts more emphasis on plant-based foods, so which are lower cost. The cost of for the family of four was still $984, um, that's in 2021. So it gives you a sense of, um, with that virtual food costing, the cost is still 
higher, substantially higher, even though the, the food basket is um, more is plant-based. Um, so households had a potential deficit after monthly expenses ranging from, um, for a family of four, $1,000.58 to $383. Overall, our data show that income assistance, minimum wages, and maternity leave benefits simply do not allow earners to meet their basic needs, including a nutritious diet, and it's exacerbated if there's a chronic condition or a disability in the household. While increases to income assistance and minimum wage have made a difference in the probability um, that individuals and families can cope, putting it simply, individuals living in low-income circumstances are faced with an impossible situation and one that's grown more impossible over time. The data from the 2021 Stats Canada um, Canadian Income Survey is consistent with our food costing data. What we're seeing is increasing rates of food insecurity across the country. So the latest data is um, from 2021, and it shows that um, nationally there's about 5.8 um, million Canadians, which is um, six, about almost 16% of Canadians that experience food insecurity. Um, this is up nearly 2.4 million since 2008. Um, but how did Atlantic, Atlantic Canadians fare? So in Nova Scotia, consist, consistently over time, rates have been significantly higher than the national average at 17.7% in 2001 experiencing household food insecurity. New Brunswick is slightly higher at 19%, second only to Alberta for the highest food insecurity across the province. New Brunswick also has the highest rate of severe food insecurity, 5.9%, the second highest rate among all Canadian provinces. Rates in PEI are a little better, just below the national average of 15.9%, but still way too high. Um, sorry, 15.3% in PEI. Collectively in Atlantic Canada, we have the highest rates um, for children under 18, ranging from 24.2% to 26.4%. So households relying on public income support, such as unemployment insurance, COVID benefits, and social assistance um, in the 2021 survey are most at risk for food insecurity. And um, these households experience food insecurity at rates of 38.5%, 41.6%, and 61%. Um, so the latter being those on income assistance. In, does that tell me I'm out of time no, or two minutes? minutes? Okay. I thought I was um, <laughs> so, um, so those rates um, are really high, like, you know, more than double the, the rate of the national average. And that's if you are dependent on um, government assistance. For as long as we've had data on household food insecurity, we've seen that Households relying on social assistance, our income support of last resort, are extremely a high risk of food insecurity. In Nova Scotia in 2018, 80% of those on income assistance experienced food insecurity. So you're pretty well guaranteed if you're on income assistance to not be able to meet your basic needs. It's not just those who don't have jobs who experience food insecurity. In 2021, 14% of households lying on, relying on wages, salaries, and self-employment reported being food insecure. And 31% of Indigenous um, people living off reserve experience food insecurity. On reserve is much higher. It's, it's at least double that. So is local food affordable and accessible to all? The short answer is no, despite lofty goals by, set by our governments and the arduous work of many people working in community, academic, and even government, we're moving further away from having just food systems. Even though local food may be less expensive compared with non-local food, in some cases, a nutritious diet is simply out of reach. Our qualitative research is um, also supports this. We've done quite a bit of qualitative research as well to understand the complexity of the experience of food insecurity and basically what, um, I'll just sort of summarize it to say that um, what we hear is that people do not feel supported. So they're, they're living um, and dealing with environments where there's just not adequate supports um, in terms of the struggle to feed their families, in terms of um, supports within systems like food banks and income assistance. They feel judged from every different angle, and um, the stress that it creates for themselves and their impact on their children is horrendous. Um, what comes to mind when they, we think of food insecurity is food banks, and um, we know that only one quarter of people who experience food insecurity actually go to food banks, and we have piles and piles of studies showing that going to a food bank 
strips dignity from people. It's widely accepted that food banks provide little more than a Band-Aid for the gaping and growing wound that the issue of food insecurity and its underlying structural determinants represents. What we hear over and over through our research is that the practice of addressing food insecurity through food banks and charitable food assistance, as well as income assistance, is grossly inadequate. What we heard is that people what people want is a just food system that honors the rights of all individuals to dignified and equitable access to healthy and sustainably produced food, including the economic and social resources to do so, to be able to earn an appropriate living and be treated fairly, and that within our communities we have systems that ensure that everyone has equitable opportunities to participate in decisions that affect them and their ability to access healthy food now and into the future. Almost done. Um, <laughs> For instance, um, with our participatory research, we've done quite a bit of evaluation, and um, the experience with women um, who have experience of food insecurity in themselves that participate as co-researchers show that by being involved, there's a deepening of capacity among participants, including um, awareness of the issue and understanding of the issue, participation, personal development, readiness to change, and, and readiness um, to advocate for, advocate for change. Um, political impact, influence on others, and self-esteem. So what do Nova Scotians want? From our research, we've seen firsthand and heard stories that show that Nova Scotians and Atlantic Canadians have the energy, wisdom, and momentum um, and resilience to create needed change. We have reams of data about the issue and what is needed. And what we've heard is that um, the time to act is now. So turn it over for the others to tell you how to do that. <laughs> Hi everyone, as Don introduced, uh, my name is Sue and um, yeah, um, Patty drew attention to a lot of uh, horrible statistics about uh, accessing local food or just food in general and uh, food security issues are definitely experienced by uh, students as well uh, all over Canada and especially by international students, marginalized students and Today I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, our organization and one way of uh, trying to counteract this issue and uh, connecting local food uh, with uh, accessibility. Um, so the Loaded Ladle was an organization that was found by a group of students back in 2009. Um, they were inspired by uh, an organization called the People's Potato in McGill, as well as uh, the movement of incorporating care uh, and solidarity into revolutionary movements and drawing inspiration um, from a very successful program in the United States, uh, Black Panther's Breakfast Program that took place in the 1960s uh, to provide food for students. Uh, they uh, went to local farmers and other local producers and asked for some uh, donations for food that they were no longer able to sell. Um, they set up a table and started serving soup out of yo yogurt containers to students uh, until, until they got kicked out of by university security because they were definitely not allowed to do so. Um, and they just um, came back uh, the next day, set up the table again and started serving again until they kicked out and they kept doing this um, every day um, until there was a following of students just coming to get free food with their own yogurt containers. Um, they did this because they were, they were angry. Um, they were angry that um, the food that they ate was controlled by Sodexo, a multi-billion, uh, multi-international company um, who decided how much they pay for food, what they eat, um, where is that food source, how are the workers treated that are preparing their food, um, and they had no say in it. And this was, done, this was done in the student union building, which was supposed to be a voice of uh, the students. Um, and, you know, through serving food, um, they drew attention to this issue, and within a year, they were able to terminate uh, the, uh, the student union's contract with Sodexo um, and gain the right to serve their own food at Dalhousie. Um, they also became a ratified society, so they were legitimate, and also became a levied society, which means that they were able to get some funds. Um, so currently, um, every student, every full-time student at Dalhousie pays $4.50 per semester out of their fees to the student union. Um, 
for us. And uh, this means that every year we were able to get some funding. Um, through time, we were able to get a kitchen space and we started to provide food regularly. Um, it started by lunches every one, once in a while to three times a week, uh, to four times a week. And currently we're providing uh, about more than 1,200 individual meals a week uh, through two programs on two campuses, um, lunches and breakfast. Uh, we also provide regular workshops and uh, cooking, cooking classes and solidarity servings for other organizations that look to dismantle different um, oppressive <laughs> systems um, by providing them with food um, and also connecting students with different um, food organizations so that they can access food. We also work with uh, 50 new volunteers uh, per semester, so that's like about 100 new volunteers per year uh, who come to prepare food for their peers. Uh, they're made up of high school students, university students, and um, community members who come to the kitchen for different reasons. They love cooking or they want to learn a new language. Uh, but it's just uh, been a space where people gather um, to talk about food, um, to get free food, and prepare food with care. Uh, it has been um, it has been great because I, the food that we ser uh, serve is ma majoritarily forced, uh, sourced uh, locally, um, and it is free. And through the act of serving free food, we are engaging more and more students into the conversation of what food security means for us. Um, and as an organization that's open, that invites everyone to participate, uh, everyone to have a say in what they eat. Uh, we've become a place that uh, our meals are impacted by the students that we serve. Uh, if students bring us an issue or community members bring an issue, uh, we gather together to respond to it immediately we're, because we're just made up of a group of like youth and students uh, who uh, meet together to discuss how we can serve the community better. And um, we have definitely created a space uh, where we f define what suits food sovereignty means for us all together. And as, a, uh, as someone who came to Canada uh, where these ideas, these terms were so new to me, um, and who got involved with the Loaded Ladle um, just to wash some dishes to thank for the one meal that I received. It has been amazing to gather with uh, students from all over the world and community members from Nova Scotia and beyond to dis discuss um, how we can eat well together and provide food, um, even just one lunch um, at a time. I'm very aware that, uh, you know, um, one lunch, one lunch, four times a week and breakfast twice a week um, does not mean much, but it does mean a lot to be serving 300 people and having these conversations and having spaces to learn and unlearn together and discuss how we can dismantle food systems and we can provide alternatives all together. And lastly, I just want to point out that the Loaded Ladle um, is not alone. We're, um, there's a lot of campus uh, societies uh, that are very similar to us that uh, tackle food security in their own way. But um, it is great uh, because of this positionality to be able to receive consistent funding from uh, the university or the union uh, through s small fees and uh, to support staff um, that we have been able to con um, start something as a protest and continue mm. to serve for 13 years now. And um, I would really love to see more university programs start off like this. There's a lot of campuses in Nova Scotia and Atlantic provinces. And, you know, comparing how many campuses there are and how many programs like us, there's definitely opportunity for that there. That's all I'm going to say to that. And thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, that's so neat. <laughs> I now I just want to go out and serve soup. Um, so I, I'm Josh, I'm, I'm from Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and what I think I'll do with the next few minutes that might be helpful is contextualize a little bit of what's been happening uh, in our province and a little bit of how our organization has sat in it. And we're trying to think our way through, as a food systems organization, how can we move this, this conversation along? And, but maybe to step out, take a step back first, I mean, I think there's, 
there's a reason that we're in this room reflecting on this, and it's the same reason that our organization is at the tables that we're at, is that it's not really meaningful to have a conversation about a thriving food system without the conversation about who can access the food that's being produced within it, right? Like, um, we, could, we could do the best possible job in the parts of our work that support production, distribution, local food knowledge, but if, if the access to all of that is so restricted, as, as, as Patty's data, I think, really clearly shows, then, then it's not really meaningful work, not in the way that it needs to be. And so I think that's what has, over the years, moved our, our organization more deeply, maybe, into the, the advocacy space, and particularly around income. Um, it's just that it's such a vital part of this. And I think Patty went over the data really well. I, I, one, one way I like to think about it, um, I, I sometimes like to wrap my head around things, I like to use ratios. And we also don't have new uh, food costing, like food basket costs yet, we will soon. But even with the old one, which was similarly, I think 2016 is last time, if you live on income support in Newfoundland and Labrador, you'd have to spend 120% of your check every week just on food to buy that basket, right? And so, like, I sometimes... I want to think about, like, what's the decision process that got us to a system like that, right? That, that like, the amount of support that would be provided to someone um, as, uh, on income support would be so far below even the deep poverty line, right? Um, and and I, I don't think today, I'm being optimistic, I don't think today if we were designing a system from scratch, we'd do it. But we inherited a system, and this mm -hmm. is maybe optimistic, but we inherited a system from a time when the attitudes towards poverty were really punitive. You know that that people should suffer their way out of it. That they they shouldn't get too comfortable. Uh, and so, like we are sitting in that system right now. And I think it's good to be aware of that. At the same time, like out in in out our way, it does feel like we're maybe at a bit of a tipping point. I'm not yet optimistic things are going to happen, but things feel possible in a way that they maybe haven't in in a while. And I, I want to think through a few things that are on the go just to give people a sense. One, uh, I mentioned a little bit when I was talking up here last night, so we did go through this process called the Health Accord, um, which was uh, an assignment from our government recognizing that our healthcare system, even more than the rest of the Atlantic Canadian healthcare systems, is a garbage fire, right? It, it, like, it's fundamentally unsustainable, it's going to collapse, it's in, in the midst of collapse now, right? And so we were, this task force was assigned the job of re-envisioning that system, um, and re-envisioning that system actually means re-envisioning the causes of, of health and particularly income, right? Uh, I think there's tons of data that we came across in that process makes it clear that we could have, again, a uh, kind of similar conversation. We could have the Cadillac sort of everything, uh, everything perfect healthcare system. We'd still only get at a, a you know, 20, 30% of the, where we need to get on, on health outcomes. And so with that conversation in mind, that report uh, came down with some recommendations that I think people around the region can look really um, positively at. It recommends a guaranteed basic income twice. Uh, once as the top line one and then again specifically for youth. Uh, it has a whole host of recommendations around wraparound services and social supports and, uh, and income, adequate income supports, all these kind of things. And I, I just want to flag that we need to think sometimes in our decision-making structures that we're all working within, you know, where's the money? And it's in health, right? Our provincial governments all spend about half of all the money they spend is in health. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not having that, this conversation in the context of what healthcare is, then, then we're at a little bit of a disadvantage. And so I think one of the things that's really interesting to see in Newfoundland and Labrador right now is that it has been put in the forefront that the conditions that would create much more food security for the people in our province are the conditions that also create health and they're, that, that, that they're being foregrounded in that way. Do I think that that's going to result in anything happening? I don't honestly know. Uh, it's been really interesting to watch decision makers confronted with that kind of thinking, right? Uh, it's much easier to say, reorganize the ambulance system, the, uh, and that one has started, right? Or re rearrange your health authorities, that one has started. Basic income? Eh. Yeah. Less so, right? And, and so I think one of the things to think about for us as, as food systems organizations is kind of how, do we, how do we support that more transformational system level work, right? How do we name that stuff? Um, and 
our approach, and we have played a little bit of a role in this uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, has been to do a little bit of coalition building. So, um, you know, coming out of COVID, we were part of all these conversations. Lots of us probably were around just recovery agendas of various kinds. Um, so we just started calling our, our pals in other community organizations that were not really food related, folks serving vulnerable populations one kind or another, and saying, can we come together on a, on a list of what we want to see happen on the other side of this tremendous disruption. And we were able to do it. And it was just, you know, Zoom call after Zoom call, the usual thing. Uh, and, and I think that's helped give some shape to working together um, with folks who don't necessarily identify as being food systems organizations, right? Uh, and that grew into a coalition advocating specifically for basic income. We ended up reaching out to the person who did the costing for the PEI report that their all party committee did. We hired him and got him to do the costing for us because, you know, how do you move these conversations along, mm -hmm. show people how much it's going to cost and how it's going to work. So we wrote a paper showing how it could work. You know, all these kind of just, it's like basic level policy advocacy work. But I think one of the things that helped us think our way through it was that um, food and access to food is so intimately connected with this broader social policy lens that even if something doesn't have food in its name, we, we, we can still like play at that table. And, and in our province as well, we don't really have um, a dedicated anti-poverty advocacy organization, right? And so food has become the terrain on which the poverty conversation is happening. Uh, and there's some problems to that, actually. I don't love it, uh, you know, because food insecurity is largely a symptom of poverty. It would be nice to be talking about the, the cause instead of the symptom. But people engage emotionally with food in this powerful mm -hmm. way, right? Uh, and so I think it has helped drive the conversation along. And one of the things that I really reflect on now is... When you go and talk to somebody, either a decision maker or in the media in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, about this, uh, they will explain to me that they know that income is the solution, which is, an, that has a, that's a real shift in the last couple of years. Now, what they'll usually say is, we know income is the solution, what else can we do? <laughs> <laughs> so, we're like halfway there, right? Uh, but, but it really has, I think, like, Shifting the, 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 the attitudes and the perceptions of people in power really does matter, right? And, and making, making it clear that solving food insecurity is not about food, really, for the most part. Uh, and that has, I think, moved in some really interesting ways. So, you know, we, as a province, uh, we just launched, a, uh, the provincial government just launched a basic income pilot for youth exiting care a couple weeks ago. There's an all-party committee on basic income starting next month. We have a new social and economic well-being plan, which uh, I'm sure will recommend basic income again. Uh, so I think what that's setting us up for provincially that, that our organization hopes to support is really pushing the, the federal government to come, come to that table and have this conversation. And, and that does matter in, in food systems spaces and, and in and similarly, I think, as food organizations, we also all need to engage on wages, right? Um, you know, I'm sure lots of us in this room have been part of these conversations in our, in our jurisdictions about uh, minimum and living wages, but if we're not, we probably should. Uh, so, you know, we did a joint submission with some national partners into our minimum wage review, and our, I'll be honest, the, the results that are, came out of that review are not great. We'll get to $15 an hour in two years which is garbage, but the report itself has actually made a lot of progress in how it does this analysis, and now if you listen, people, it's pretty clear, I think we'll, we'll see that schedule moved ahead, right? So again, just bringing more food folks into that conversation has really mattered, and I think one of the things we're thinking about now is how do we bring even more people who, who have food in their name, or food in the name of what they're doing, into those conversations, uh, particularly the, the food charity folks, people doing food banking and meal programs, um, how, can, how can they be a bigger part of this advocacy conversation? And how do we have a conversation about ending the need for those, those organizations while also having a conversation about how to make the experience of accessing food charity better in the short term, right? Um, and that's the other, I think, focus for us. So we've been doing this process called Rethinking Food Charity for the last year, uh, which is, we have a big summit next week. It's kind of tor heading towards the end. We've been listening to folks with lived experience of food insecurity, many of whom have never accessed food charity, but some who have, and listening to food charities as well about how can we navigate through 
to a version of that system that is less stigmatizing to access and, and less, um, less judgmental, uh, more supportive, more, uh, and, and provides more access to those kind of wraparound supports. Because I think when you think about the, the, the way we've built our system of food charity by and large, um, it has so many barriers within it, and it's a system that's actually easier to use if you're a repeat long-term user than if you're someone in crisis. And that's the exact reverse of what it should be, right? So all in all, I think we just need to think about how all of us can maybe play a role in activating those conversations. And the last thing I'll say, just as a nonprofit person up here, is the reason lots of us don't is because we're scared, right? We're scared of getting our funding cut off. Like, it hasn't happened. Uh, and maybe, maybe it will, uh, it hasn't happened to us, and, and, and I think there is, there's more space than we think uh, to be critical on these, uh, in these conversations, and, and we should take it if we can. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now for something completely different. <laughs> Although quite related. Um, I study income-based food insecurity, but I also study a relatively unacknowledged problem about food systems that come together for a certain population of Canadians. So, and that's in terms of families, children, but specifically babies. So there's a growing body of research on infant food insecurity here in Canada and other high-income countries, and I just like that you just sit with that thought, what that possibly could be, infant food insecurity, for a minute. It's like our babies. Um, so, and it's really how food insecurity and food poverty, if we want to use that term, impacts the way infants are fed. So most of my academic work examines that at the household level. And by this I mean the condition of not having enough food, as well as suboptimal food quality, hunger, or risk of hunger during infancy due to lack of money in the home. So children zero to two. I'm just gonna share a few little insights from a body of research that's related to this, so both quantitative and qualitative research, and some of this that did with Patty. The work shows that infants are at risk of infant-related food insecurity in ways that are linked to their unique ways of eating. The limited and specialized food substances they consume and the lack of economic and social protection afforded to sustainable breastfeeding or optimal formula feeding here in Canada and elsewhere. So this is where I come into, it is about food systems. An infant's access to food is shaped by something we could think of as first food systems and the dynamics around them. So whether those be related to what is needed to support breastfeeding as a food production system or a stable supply of other alternative infant foods. And there's many policy eyes on the food system, but not first food systems. And there's many policy eyes on infant feeding, but not on how poverty and food insecurity undermines it. And there's a growing amount of in research on household food insecurity, but much less on how it impacts babies through the ways in which they're fed. And while infant food supply is made up of primarily two streams, our commercial formulas and our non-commercial breastfeeding food systems, we know that 91% of Canadian mothers who initiate breastfeeding, they init of those that initiate, only about one-third breastfeed exclusively for six months meaning that most infants rely on formula to a varying extent. And our research at Acadia shows that first food systems are under threat. So this isn't really a good news story. Um, and while we can think of breastfeeding as a pathway to security, 
And, and we do know that there's high initiation rates amongst food insecure mothers that are no different than food secure mothers in Canada. Maternal food poverty completely undermines it. We've identified that food insecure Canadian mothers stop exclusive breastfeeding earlier than food secure mothers, which creates a bit of a breastfeeding paradox. Why those that could most benefit from the cost savings of breastfeeding are also those that are more likely to actually need to buy food through the commercial food market. Food insecurity, though, is the reason they give of why. So it's both the driver, sometimes, of why someone is driven to breastfeed, but it's also the underminer. The resulting poor diets and claims of insufficient milk supply are the reasons that mothers will provide for stopping to breastfeed. And collaboratively with Patty, we, in the food costing research she mentioned, you know, we did look at low-income scenarios for families with babies and found that regardless of how a baby's fed, those low-income scenarios would put that family hundreds of dollars in the hole if they had purchased a basic nutritious diet. So that's whether the mother was breastfeeding to cover the extra caloric intake that was required or to purchase formula. The difference was only about $30. When, when it was all said and done, but that's $30 in the hole, um, just to be clear. Um, we don't know how many babies in Canada are food insecure or living in food insecure households, but we do know that children under one are, have the highest child poverty rates in the country. So this is per, the time of life when we have particular nutritional needs and it's the time of life when families are also the most poor. Problems of food affordability affect, though, both breastfeeding and formula feeding. And when breastfeeding fails and infant formula is not affordable, the outcomes are tragic. There's no government-provided infant formula in this country, unlike other high-income countries, meaning that in Canada, people are are forced to forage for formula from charity organizations which may be inconsistently available or not available at all. And we shouldn't be surprised that infant formula is now one of the top items of retail theft, mm -hmm. leading it to be commonly kept behind locked bars and service counters, and you may have noticed this in your local food outlets. And we shouldn't be surprised that mothers turn to Facebook Marketplace in Kijiji to get second-hand, at times, opened infant formula online from strangers. The cur current cost of living crisis is only exacerbating this, and reports from the UK that over the last couple of months are sounding the alarm for families there in desperate need of infant formula. And on top of this, there is an emerging food stability and availability threat concerning infant formula access. So the 2022 infant formula shortage in North America, which spilled over into Canada, we saw empty formula shelves at grocery stores, panic buying, stockpiling, and desperate families struggling to find formula. By early 2022, 43% of formula was out of stock in the US. And because Canada imports 100% of its infant formula, it wasn't long before the U.S. shortage arrived here in its own fashion, primarily affecting specialty formulas for people with, with babies with allergies. But caregivers are still continuing to struggle in accessing critical nutrition for infants in both countries across socioeconomic divides. And the formula shortage reveals a frailty of the industrial food system, which is, was another layered blow on top of what we already knew about the existing problem of infant food insecurity and first food systems. And these shocks are likely are to continue to occur, and we do have a history of such shocks. We saw it in the aftermath of Katrina. We saw it in the Fort McMurray wildfires, 
and formula supplies in Australia, shortages caused by uh, the demand from China in the aftermath of the Chinese milk scandal, and recently just globally due to COVID-19 supply chain disruptions. And the potential nutrition consequences of this, this first food system threats to a lactating mother, to a breastfed or formula-fed baby are concerning because it's well established that the first 1,000 days of life is the most critical for optimizing growth and development in childhood and into adulthood. Our new data from a study we did at Acadia the early part of this year, we heard from 14,000 families, caregivers of babies with children under two, before the shortage, this was even before the shortage, and 31% of those families were food insecure. The national data, of course, is showing much lower rates. Just to share, 27% worried their babies were hungry while breastfeeding because their mother was not eating enough, because they didn't have enough money for food. 26 formula fed while breastfeeding because there was not enough money for mother's food. Among all the formula feeders, a third had difficulty finding formula in, the, in stores nearby, and 70% needed to travel to buy it beyond where they normally shop. 64% of food insecure caregivers worried about having enough money to purchase formula. 34 switched brands to lower, cheaper types of brands. 51% of all the caregivers, those food insecure caregivers, borrowed money to help feed their family, their baby. Eight used other milk, like cows, goats, powdered, canned milk. 6% added water to their formula to make it stretch. And 4% used it beyond its expiry date and 4% stole it from retail stores. We cannot separate infant food insecurity from maternal and family food security. And there are systems in place to help us get there. And they're in the form of economic protections for families to ensure that infants, children, and their families' rights to food are protected. We need to target prenatal and postnatal income transfers to children, and there's a system in place, the Canada Child Benefit, it's ready to go. We need enhanced practical support for breastfeeding and formula feeding in the community. There's a system in place for that. It's ready to go through the Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program. We need an affordable commercial system, given the struggles families are facing, and we need a non-commercial distribution system to ensure access in times of crisis so families are not forced to forage for infant formula. We need both short and long-term strategies to stabilize supply, which would include Canadian production and emergency feeding pathways in times of crisis. And I'll just end on Canadian babies do not need to be going hungry in one of the richest countries in the world. Thank you. So just open the um, floor to questions. Yeah. Uh, just because it's, it's relevant to um, what you were just speaking about, um, do you have any strong opinions on breast milk sharing uh, communities? Um, I, I actually was going to mention that in the end. We also don't have a system for breast milk sharing, nor real access to milk banking at all, right? So the milk banks that do exist are primarily for ill babies, right? So that, that milk's prioritized. And, you know, there's, there's the health, you know, Health Canada comes out against it, you know, because the milk's not pasteurized. 
Um, and then there's arguments that say that that's ridiculous, you know. So, and, and personally, you know, I, you know, we don't, we're not investing in milk production for sharing in any way or supporting that. In the same way, we're not supporting people's access to any alternatives. So, you know, people are breastfeeding other people's babies. I mean, I in the study I did on access, well, like what was happening in terms of sharing on social media and in Kijiji, I'll, I equally collected data on breast milk sharing. So, there's certainly, lots of it happening, um, and people are are mobilizing. Mothers are mobilizing with their own agency to solve their own problems around this, right? So, um, same in the states with the formula shortage. I found over 100 new exchange ads around just infant formula. Mothers and fathers, other caregivers, helping people find formulas with pictures like here it is in this store at this time, and uh, shipping it across the country and into Canada. So you know, so yes, no. That's, we need to invest in both, you know, produced breast milk and get it to people who need it and, and, vice, and formula, infant formula. I'm going to probably suggest just one more question, unfortunately. <laughs> This isn't necessarily a question or comment for the panel, it's more just to have the mic for the room. <laughs> when we're talking about availability and accessibility, I just want to put this out there that we can't forget about the non-humans. I think sometimes we always are talking about human issues and access and the amount of local food available for us, but we need access to those cultural services for humans, but also those green corridors for the non-humans to move, for our mainland moose to come back, for our populations for our native bees, not just honeybees, to be pollinators. And not just bees, for instance, but like all pollinators. So just wanted to put that out there. And my, I do have one comment for Sue, because I love what the, little, the Loaded Ladle is doing. I have also attended a lot of the events. Um, I'm curious, was there a lot of pushback from the students when they looked at their financial statement and saw that they're paying a little portion, which is going to a good cause, but did you find that you had to do a lot of no, like knowledge mobilization in terms of the good that that is going into? Um, it's not really clear to them that their money is going there, which is uh, really, well, that's a fallback of the student union that's supposed to be representing them, but I usually explain to the people uh, that their food is going there when I'm serving them, and uh, the most, I'm just like, you know the thousand dollars that you pay for the student union? Nine dollars out of that comes to us. And they're like, oh, I've eaten more than nine dollars worth of share for this. And we do run like opt-out campaigns. Um, for It's in our policy. It's, if people don't want to pay money to us, they obviously do not have to. Um, we don't get a lot of students that uh, get their money back, especially because they find out about us. And then they're like, oh, well, I won't give back my money, I'll just come to eat. So that has been the, um, yeah, result. Wow, we rock. Can, I'll just, can I just add, yes. I'm hosting a table talk or whatever they're mm -hmm. called right after this, um, if anybody wants to join me. Which room? I don't know. <laughs> the one that starts with L. The one that starts with L. Lockheed, I think. Yeah. It's a little boardroom yeah. thing down there. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And I thank you. Well, Alio. Well,